Now, next up, I would like to introduce to you my colleague, Dr. Kojin Bohenik. He is now going to give you a talk about veganism and karma theory. Dr. Bohenik, I will turn it over to you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Chris, for that introduction and for that uh, amazing talk. Um, it really is something unique and beautiful that we're seeing in the Jain tradition. As a scholar of religion, I interact in a lot of different um, religious traditions, and each one of them has their own unique beauty. Uh, but one of the things that I find to be particularly inspiring about the Jain tradition is that as far as I can tell, it seems to be the only tradition that really has a very robust vegan and animal advocacy movement within it. It's not to say it doesn't exist in other traditions, it certainly does, but the uh, magnitude and the gravity of it in the Jain tradition seems to be unique. This experience of people taking vows of veganism on the spot is uh, something that I've seen myself and have been very inspired by. And it seems to be uh, unique and beautiful in the Jain tradition, possibly because of the centrality of nonviolence and compassion that Chris pointed out, but also um, the centrality of karma theory. Um, really, we can think about the uh, Jain tradition as really being centered around karma theory. And uh, I want to point out just a few minor points uh, well, I find them to be pretty profound, maybe they're not minor, uh, about the um, importance of karma theory and how that can, uh, the potential that that can have in terms of creating a robust vegan and animal advocacy uh, movement. So as an academic ethicist, um, one of the main things that I do is I try to hone in on what the various different paradigms and worldviews of the modern age are and how they can be corrected in a way that can create a more ethical society. And one of the things that I believe has become problematic in the modern uh, world is the idea that justice is a matter of social contract, a matter of personal opinion, and only a matter of agreement amongst groups and societies, rather than justice being an objectively real force in the universe, an objectively real thing apart from human social construction. Um, so we can ask ourselves what the, what the implications are of that. What would a society look like if we collectively believed that justice was more than just social conventions and social constructs? If it was a real force, a governing principle of reality, what if it was more uh, when we felt fairness or unfairness? What if that was actually our perceptions our capacities to perceive reality as it is. Um, we can see this with young children. You know, one of the major fixations, if you've ever been around young children, is they are uh, very fixated on what's fair and what's not fair, you know, tattletailing on each other. And it's as if they have a, 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 a sharper sensory perception where they can perceive this quality of reality that we might call justice in a way that we kind of lose as we get older, when we do something we know is wrong, but we think we can get away with it, or we do something that's wrong, but may not be illegal. So we just say, well, it's okay, it's allowed by our society, we'll do it anyway, such as the case of animal agriculture, violence against animals, and food production is not illegal, so people just do it anyway, irrespective of whether it's right or wrong. And that's because if justice is a mere social contract, then why shouldn't we just do what society allows if right and wrong is just a matter of human agreement? So um, with the Jane tradition, I propose that justice is much more than just a social construct. It's really an inherent factor of reality. And when we believe that justice is real governing force of the universe, the same way gravity or mathematics is, or any of these other uh, laws of physics, justice is just as real as any of those, uh, then we can see a situation where perpetrators uh, are accountable for their behavior, whether their behavior is legal or not, or whether they're caught or not, or whether anybody even notices if justice is a governing force, then we're held accountable for our actions, irrespective of what our laws do, irrespective of whether people perceive what we're doing. And that makes us more, uh, if we had that belief as a society, that would make us more morally accountable for our actions. We'd have a greater impulse to behave ethically than if we were just believing that justice was a mere construct or social contract alone. Um, so this means that we would go beyond um, our just impulses for self-interest because self-interest would always have a consequence that we would be accountable for. 
So we'd have to start thinking about the interests of others because that would also be our self-interest because we're accountable. There would be no more division between self-interest and uh, other interests, between uh, altercentrism and egoism. Uh, to help the other would be to help it oneself if justice was an objectively real quality of reality. And that's why I believe promoting a belief system where justice is objectively real is of critical importance to addressing the sort of ethical issues of modernity. Um, so how does Jane tradition propose that justice is an objectively real force? Um, when we perceive something as fair or unfair, that's not just a matter of personal opinion, that is actually perceiving reality is. That's the objectively real quality. And if that's true, then things like racism, misogyny, and speciesism, it's not just that we agree that those are wrong. It's that they are objectively, inherently wrong categories of actions. It's not just a matter of social agreement or personal opinion. And this is spoken about in the Jane tradition through the karma theory. Karma theory is basically a way of saying that justice is a real force that governs reality. It's the operating mechanism of the universe. And we're all subjected to the rules of justice the same way we're subjected to the rules of gravity or any other natural law. Um, it's an objectively real quality of reality. And this, if we had that belief, if reality were, if, if our societies were to get beyond the ignorance that Parveen Jain spoke about, the ignorance that makes us think that we can just hurt animals with impunity, right? If we, if we believe that justice was a real governing force, that if we got beyond that ignorance, then we'd be more impelled to behave ethically, uh, particularly in situations where something may be wrong but not illegal, such as the case of animal agriculture. And so when we have that deep sense, think about um, how do you know anything is true? Well, we say seeing is believing. We can trust our sense perception of sight. Well, why can't we trust our sense perception of that's wrong? How do I know it's wrong? Because I feel it wrong. I can feel it in the pit of my stomach. Well, arguably that feeling in the pit of your stomach, something's right or something's wrong, that is sensory data that's evidence for karma theory, for the idea that justice is a real quality of reality. Now, I love a great many world religious traditions, and I've studied so many in depth. And again, I think there's something unique and beautiful about the science of karma theory that we see in the Jain tradition. Uh, the distinction between what's alive and what's not alive, and how we as living beings engage in actions that have consequences, and then we're beholden to those consequences, right? How we as uh, conscious beings deal with a non-conscious reality, which then affects other conscious beings, and then has uh, corresponding effects. You know, we say uh, in thermodynamics, a reaction has an equal and opposite reaction, right? If, if that's true for matters, of, for laws of matter, why isn't why wouldn't that be true for matters of consciousness? Acts of consciousness and intention and volition have equal and opposite reaction. When we behave virtuously, we can expect virtue. When we behave unethically, we can expect others to behave unethically. And the science of the Jain tradition has really nuanced this uh, to talk about how this in terms of karma, how it is that karma um, influxes, how it sticks to us. And the metaphor of it sticking to us is that we as conscious beings have an inherent goodness, an inherent beauty that's full expression is restricted when we engage in violent actions that then restricts us through karma. And then how we can burn that karma off and eventually liberate ourselves so that the expression, the full expression of our internal goodness can be allowed to express itself fully in full human uh, development, full spiritual development. And the centrality of, dar of karma theory and the Jain tradition is you know, illustrated in so many places in the literature, but I would just cite this one little section on the Moksha Mala by Srimad Rajchandra, a famous, a very important uh, contemporary um, modern Jain teacher. And what he says here is that the, the Nav Tattvas, the laws of karma, uh, they're, they're define all the comings and goings of the universe. And that um, all of religion essentially is focused and centered, centered around analyzing our ethical and our unethical behavior 
by understanding the mechanisms of karma. So it's the governing force of the universe, and it's also the primary and principal concern of religious traditions, of Dharma traditions. And that's how central um, Dharma is, or excuse me, karma is. So um, in the Jain tradition, uh, we can think about, so my first point that I wanted to make is how justice is objectively real and how that could change our worldview in modern society if we as a society were to believe in that rather than justice being a mere matter of opinion and social contract. The second thing that I want to emphasize here is that um, ethics are a matter of personal development, of spiritual development, of unleashing the potential of who we are. Uh, our internal goodness, the qualities of our consciousness are restricted by all the damage control that we're having to do based on the effects of our actions. We hurt somebody and that has repercussions. We have to deal with those repercussions and we do that instead of focusing on understanding our own internal goodness. So every time we create actions that have opposite reactions that are violent, we end up having to deal with damage control rather than focusing on our own spiritual development. And so the second thing I want to emphasize here is that veganism is not just a way of recognizing justice as a universal law, but it can also be a way of practicing and developing our own personal, internal, spiritual um, development. So for moral language, for ethical language to be coherent, it requires three things. Um, an understanding of who we are uh, as untutored human beings, um, our natural impulses for self-interest at the expense of others. You can see this as children who don't want to share or you know, people who destroy the planet and don't care about another, other generations. That's our untutored uh, human nature, just as we are. But then we get an idea of who we could be if we were to refine our character and become ethically, and then to get from our untutored human nature to who we could be, the various different moral precepts and the various different behaviors that we would follow to do that. And then, of course, Chris uh, Miller has already given us a list of those, and I could go over those just pretty quickly here, um, some of the uh, ways that um, the Jane tradition talks about how we go from our untutored nature to the moral precepts that we would follow to realize our full human development. And by this, then ethical behaviors such as veganism become spiritual and transformational. So veganism isn't just something that you do because it's the right thing to do, which, I mean, that's a great reason to do anything. But you also can do it because, again, if justice is a real force of the universe, there's no longer a dichotomy, a binary between self-interest and altruism. They're actually one in the same. So helping others is helping oneself. So practices such as veganism, which is reducing one's violence and living in a more compassionate way, is a way that we can transform and veganism then becomes a spiritually transformational practice um, based on the idea of karma and justice being universal law. And uh, I believe that's my time right there. Am I correct? Uh, you still have a few more minutes until uh, okay. 9.50 Pacific time. Oh, 9.50. Okay, sorry, I thought it was 40. Okay, so let's uh, start with these three requirements that we would have for a coherent ethical system. Unhuman tutored nature, who we could be if we were to develop that nature, and then the ethical precepts that allow us to go from one to the other. So within Jain literature, we can look at all three of these. So the first of them, let's talk about untutored human nature. How the Jain tradition talks about us as we're born into this world with this sort of sensory desire, this deep sense of lack that we have. We're born into this world feeling like we need something. And that's because karma has restricted our full potential at birth, right? The karma from previous lives. And we come into this world feeling that restriction, that idea that our potential is being held back. And so the way we deal with that is we think, well, if I just get this, then I can feel more fulfilled, right? If I feel a lack, then if I get this, then I will no longer lack. And that's how desire is born. So we think, oh, if I get the job, if I get the car, if I get the career, if I get the family, if I get the spouse, all of those things will help me feel, feel that deep sense of lack that we're born into this world with, right? But the problem with uh, these types of things is they involve consumption. 
And with consumption, whenever we take from the world, we contribute to the chain of supply and demand. And the problem with that from a Jane perspective, from a perspective of karma theory, from a perspective of universal justice, is that in every act of consumption, somewhere on the supply chain, there is an act of violence, no matter what it is. Of course, there are things that we can consume that involve more violence, like fast food animal products are probably the most violent thing we could consume. But anytime we consume more than we need, somewhere on the supply chain, uh, there's fossil fuels being burned, there's plastics being used to pollute our oceans, there's labor that's being exploited, and there's animals that are being killed and harmed. So when we come into this world with this sense of unfulfilled desire and this need to get more, we try to get happiness external to us, right? And in the process, we commit violence, right? So in the Acharaka Sutra, what it tells us is that when we engage in violent acts, knowingly or unknowingly, but it's particularly worse when we do so knowingly, when we engage in violent acts, there's what's called in psychology, the perpetrator effect. It is as harmful to the perpetrator as it is the victim. In the process of engaging in violence, you are hurting yourself. And if that's true, a collective society that's engaged in killing billions of animals a year, we're traumatized because we're damaging our own psyche. Even if we try to be indifferent to that, we're still damaging ourselves in the act of violence, so says the um, Acharanga Sutra, and that damage manifests in a de deprivation of spiritual wisdom. Again, like what Carvine Jane was saying, is it's like this ignorance that causes people to create violence more often than malice. And that ignorance happens when we create violence, we become more ignorant. So it becomes a sort of endless cycle. Um, and because that in the process of consumption, we create violence, that karma restricts, it imposes on the uh, internal goodness of our soul. So it says the Acharanga Sutra, and the root of all karma is violence because all action involves taking and involves bringing from the world. I mean, all consumptive action is uh, fundamentally karmic <laughs> because as I said, somewhere on the supply chain, violence is happening. So that's who we are in our untutored uh, human nature is we're beings who have this impulse for desire because we feel unfulfilled, because we've been restricted from previous karma. We don't feel the fullness of our internal goodness. And to fill that, we try to get more things that creates more violence and the problem keeps going on. That is our untutored human nature. But we can realize who we could be if we refine ourselves, if we refine our character, if we refine our ethical actions through things like veganism, which drastically reduce the amount of violence that we contribute to. So once we get this vision of who we could be, uh, then we can start moving towards it. And so Jain tradition uh, has a number of different ways to talk about this. For example, the Yoga Shastra speaks about the um, internal goodness of the soul as being chid and ananda, as being uh, pure consciousness and pure happiness. So this really turns things upside down. When we think that getting something external is going to make us happy, that's an illusion. Actually, happiness comes from within. And a lot of times, thinking external forms of happiness are going to create satisfaction actually distracts us from looking to the true source of happiness, which is within. So who we could be if we develop our behavior develop ourselves ethically through actions like going vegan and reducing our violence is actually infinitely happy, right? It's the external actions that restricts our happiness, all right? Uh, and so therefore, um, through ethical behavior, we can create this sort of transformation where we go from degrees of happiness or degrees of restricted happiness, which we perceive as unhappiness. And we can move from that two degrees of more robust expressions of happiness is the internal goodness of our soul is no longer restricted by karma. And it's a transformational, the same way that iron can turn into gold, touching quicks, uh, silver. Now, uh, Christopher Miller pointed out um, the characteristics of the Tirthankaras um, in their enlightenment its experience involves this deep sensitivity to what other beings are feeling. And we see this described in the Kalpa Sutra, which describes um, the enlightenment experiences of multiple different Tirthankaras that <clears throat> Chris talked about what a Tirthankara is. 
Coaching that, that Dr. Bohenic, I just wanted to say we're on time now. So, but we're on time now. Oh, okay. Yeah, I thought it was one minute. Okay. So let me just wrap it up. So we can see that as being an expression of who we could be um, if we realize our spiritual potential. Part of that involves being infinitely more sensitive to other living beings, what they're going through. And that's how we cultivate ourselves ethically. And that leads to our own fuller expressions of happiness. And therefore, um, karma theory can, can uh, teach us that veganism is an essential process to our own spiritual development. All right. Thank you.